Hey you guys, this is the Coupling Spire podcast. Here's a couple of things you might need to know or maybe you just forgot. I'm Taylor, a volunteer firefighter and also a firewife to my favorite firefighter. Join me as I talk anything and everything fire related. I don't claim to be an expert. I just love to talk fire and I'm not afraid to get into real and deep discussions. Everything I say is my own opinion and does not reflect the opinions of any agency or organization I am associated with. Let's get on with the episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Couplings Fire podcast. This is going to be a good episode for you guys, a fun episode for you guys. I've heard of this amazing guy from so many different realms of social media. I first heard of him on Richard Zuniga's uh, Zuni, uh, his YouTube page when he had it up. Um, and everything. And since then, it seems like I've seen the Williams key everywhere. Oh no, I just dropped it, but you guys already actually, Uh. it's like, you guys already, you know, looked at the actual title of the episode. So you guys know that I'm talking with Trevor Williams of the Williams key. So Trevor, thank you so much for being on today. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm glad this worked out. Excited to be here. I know this is, this is, this is ridiculously exciting. Okay. Before we get too far into this, cause we're going to just jump in because, uh, we got, you know, it's Friday night. We got some places to be at the same time, but like, I want to have a good conversation and really dig into everything without being too constrained for time. So quick housekeeping. First of all, if you guys like the podcast, go ahead and give it a rating and review, um, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you do give it a rating and review, send me a screenshot and I'll send you some stickers. And then uh, next thing for housekeeping and last thing for housekeeping for tonight is going to be um, uh, Flame Decon. This is Firefighter Decon Decontamination Soap. If you guys want to get 15% off your purchase, use Couplings15, that code, at checkout at flamedecon.com. Try it out. It's good stuff. I use it all the time. Um, you know, you decon your rigs, you decon your gear, start deconning your bodies too. So, all right. Ooh, that's probably the quickest housekeeping I've ever done. <laughs> I always thought your housekeeping pitch was like pre-recorded, but I just no. saw you do it live. So you just you're every, just every episode it. it's live. It's <laughs> live. So like all those little mess ups or whatever, like it just comes out here. <laughs> and uh, no, I, you you yeah. got it down pretty good. So it sounds Thank pre-recorded, you. but everybody listening, it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's live. It's live. This is how I do things. <laughs> so all the, all the little stumbles and trips ups, trip, trips ups, and now you can tell it's really live. Trip ups are live, and I keep them all in. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, Trevor, let, let's, let's dig in. So first off, the thing I love asking everybody, tell us about yourself. And after you get done telling us about yourself, how did you find your way into the fire service? All right. Well, yes, my name is Trevor Williams. I am 33 years old. I live in California in the Los Angeles area. I'm married. I have a nine-month-old daughter and another daughter on the way, about four months along. Um, I'm a firefighter out here for the Los Angeles County Fire Department. And I am the inventor of the Williams key as well. So that's my background. Um, well, I, get, I guess deeper into my background, I grew up as a missionary. I lived in Africa for about four years. I lived in the country of Zaire, which is now called the Democratic Republic of Congo. And okay. also South Africa. We were there during a, a war. Um, so we were trying to stay safe as much as possible, trying to help out in the meantime, but eventually it got too dangerous and we had to Mm -hmm. evacuate out of Africa and we ended up living in Connecticut for a little bit. Um, From there, I was younger, I was like a a preteen and then we moved to Haiti uh, when I was 12. Um, Haiti is an island in the Caribbean, it's attached to the Dominican Republic. Together, they make up the island of Hispaniola. It's below Florida, about 565 miles south. Um, And it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It's much like Africa, but a lot smaller and more condensed. Um, So we were doing the the same missionary type work there. My family was. My dad worked for World Vision, and it's emergency relief work. So just helping out uh, wherever the need might be. That is amazing. Um, just, sorry, I, I'm going to do this not, not to not to be rude. I promise. So just because like I can't help but talk to you about some of this stuff. 
it's so exciting to see you come from this background too, because it's a background that not many of us have any experience in. And I can only imagine what that did to help shape what you have been doing in life now. Yeah, it it, it definitely did. I grew up helping people mm -hmm. and um, in a, in a high stress environment during, there was also a, a civil war going on in uh, Haiti, a, civil unrest, I guess you could say, um, government, government, president being overthrown. So a lot like it was in Africa with, with the war that they were having. Um, so high stress environment, helping out people was mm -hmm. what was all I knew, um, <laughs> growing up. And, uh, when I moved to the States, people who don't live in America called America, the States, um, <laughs> when I moved to the States, I didn't know what I was going to do. And, uh, people started suggesting pretty unanimously a fireman or a firefighter. Um, that's somebody who helps people in high stress environments. And I could continue doing that if I had a passion for it. And I did, I loved helping people and, and I still do. So as a 15 and a half year old, I moved to California out of Haiti, um, again, evacuating to safety. Oh goodness. Yeah. And, um, I started pursuing the Explorer program, which is, for those who don't know, a training program for teenagers and kids who aren't on the job yet, um, where they can get with career firemen and learn the fire culture and train with them and do ride-alongs. And uh, I did that, and they sent me through a little academy. <laughs> I, th I think it was four weeks either four or eight weeks long um, on the weekends because you're still like going to school and all that stuff in the meantime. And uh, doing that allowed me to get certified as an explorer and start going on ride alongs. Okay. The, the ride alongs would be 24 hours. It could be pretty much any station I wanted within this was through LA County Fire Department. So LA County Fire Department has 177 fire stations. And I could call and see if they'd let me ride out with them. Um, so I did that as much as possible. Um, that is such a cool program. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really cool. Is it still running today? Um, yes and no. Different because form. There's a little <laughs> pause during the uh, ah. uh, pandemic, if you will. Yeah. Um, so the, they've been uh, slowly rolling back into it. But um, I think... <sighs> Yeah, I, I think they took a little pause, unfortunately. Um, but I, I think it'll start back up again. So, yeah. I mean, so just talk about recruitment, like l l filtering in, like already getting getting these kids, you know, into this explore program. Because even if you don't stay there as a firefighter or get in there or whatever it is, like you're going to go somewhere else. And you're going to want to keep doing it if you fall in love with it during the program. <laughs> yeah, you, you learn pretty quick whether it's for you or not. You know, yeah. you see your, your first drop of blood or <laughs> you see fire for the first time and either you love it or you, you really it's don't. Not, it's not for you, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I did that. Um, they let you do that until you are 21 years old. So mm -hmm. um, at 18, and I think it was 19. I got hired with a volunteer department out here and there's not many volunteer departments in Los Angeles County. There's I was there's wondering about two. that. Yeah. Yeah. And now the one that I used to volunteer at, I was there for four years are full time now. So they're not even a volunteer department anymore. <laughs> um, and so I think there's only one left and it's competitive to, to be a firefighter out here as a career firefighter. But even the volunteers are very competitive because there's not much of it. And yeah, it's like a resume builder. And the department I worked for was called Sierra Madre Fire Department, a small, small city. Um, but they used all the same equipment that L.A. County Fire, which was the department I wanted to get hired by because I'd done their Explorer program and everything. Mm -hmm. they, they worked with L.A. County. They were in L.A. County. They used the same engines and breathing apparatus and all the same equipment so it was like pretty much perfect for me to take that next step oh yeah oh exactly so did that for a few years in the meantime i i applied as soon as i turned 18 with la county and our our sister department 
is LA City. It's a, it's another big department out here. And then I went on to test or apply with 60 different departments. And I traveled all over the US taking tests. I, I took FDNY's tests and Dallas Fort Worth and My Washington and everywhere. So I was motivated. Um, oh, yeah. But ultimately, I got hired with my dream department out here, uh, LA County Fire. So that's awesome. But you don't hear of a lot of people going like testing for all over the county or all over the, the country like that, though. So, so your experience with testing all over the country was it pretty much the same in every place or were they extremely like drastically different on the procedures of how everyone kind of did? Nobody's asked me that question. That's a good I, question. <laughs> um, there were some differences, but it all started with a written test. Mm -hmm. And that's about as far as I was getting for the most part, occasionally a oral interview. Mm. Um, and that, yeah, they're hard. They're tough. And if yeah. you're not like, like, let's say I wanted to take Dallas Fort Worth's test. If I wasn't living there and visiting stations and new people who I could study with, I was going to just do okay instead of great because I didn't really have that edge, yeah. um, especially with New York. You, you're, you're getting extra points if you're a veteran, which I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, if you live in the city, if you have family on the job. So there's definitely some prefer preferentials um, getting dealt out that I just wasn't getting. So, so uh, one more question with that then too. So did you... Did you have to travel out for each step for each place or was it with the that you maybe take the online or the written test online or anything or no? So every step was a different trip or were they able to combine any of that for you? I never took two tests in the same trip. Okay. So there, I think it was, there's a place called Kern County out here, which I can drive to fortunately. And I think they had like a dual test interview process okay. so you yeah. can do, do them both in like one day i'm a little fuzzy on it but that's the only scenario i heard of um that was like that otherwise yeah you're taking a bunch of trips. <laughs> if you do well you're, yeah, you're taking a yeah. bunch of trips to continue on with the process well it, it shows how dedicated you were to to get on to somewhere and to really try for anywhere you know the fact that you're willing to take these different trips around the entire country you know going here and there and here you know and everything and honestly it must have been pretty cool to see the country too <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I, I had one goal and one goal only for the most part. Which yeah. To get on. Do well, do well yeah. on the test and get hired. And I'd always try and visit a fire station um, mm -hmm. during the testing process. I remember I flew to San Francisco and I had my little suitcase. I, I took the test and one of the fire stations let me leave my bag at their station because I wasn't like had anywhere to stay or anything. And um but I remember it's very hilly in San Francisco. So I remember mm. like in a suit and tie, dragging my suitcase like up these big hills, <laughs> trying to like find the fire station I left my bag at. But luckily, you know, it's a brotherhood and a sisterhood and they're all very nice. You know, they they all yeah. are supportive of everybody who's passionate about the job. And I clearly was. And, uh, you know, these strangers, you know, wanted to help me as much as possible. And that, that's probably the biggest takeaway I got was the fire culture all around the U.S. was the same. You know, it's a big family. That's awesome. That is, that is so, so cool to hear. <laughs> okay, so you, got, so you got on L.A. County, and it's just, um, what age was that? Did you get on there then? I was, so I've been with them about seven years. Okay. I got hired around 26. Okay, fantastic. So, um, so uh, did it take a few years then to get hired on there, or like, so several different, processes yeah. through it so <laughs> so seven years six no yeah about seven years to get hired with them because i applied when i was 18 yeah and i was like slowly went through the process it was a year apart for like from the written to the oral interview and then there was a hiring freeze and then it kind of mm. had to start over again and i remember i took i think i took medicals three times and my background's twice because it was like a year was lapsing. Oh um, goodness! <laughs> and, and they like weren't hiring people, um, so it was a very painful process. Like, yeah, I, I just I felt like I was so close for so long, but it, it was at a snail's pace. But Again, I, goes to show that like you don't quit because seven years later you got on. Yeah, you don't so. quit, and I kept my nose clean and 
Mm -hmm. you know, didn't, didn't get in trouble and worked hard. And in the meantime, I was working construction. I was a commercial contractor, uh, doing, doing carpentry, installing doors. Um, and that gets us into (laughs) kind of where the Williams key came from. Um, but while I was doing that, I was treating it like the fire service. I was, okay. I'd have to throw ladders sometimes. So I'd throw my ladder the same way I'd throw it at the fire department. I'd stretch out my extension cord, like I would a fire hose and, you know, showed up on time, did, you know, just did everything the way that I would treat the fire service. That is gold. That is awesome. I love, I love that. I love the fact that you're doing the exact same things, especially like, like you said, with the ladders and things you're throwing it the exact same way that you would be. So you're not getting yourself into bad habits by any means, you know, and you're perfectly ready to go where it's just going to be hopefully as seamless as possible going straight into that. Right. And the, actually with the uh, volunteer department I worked at as well, I knew that that's not where I was going to end up, you know, Mm -hmm. like the goal was career, uh, career firefighting. So I never got complacent in that volunteer spot. I never Mm -hmm. took a nap or like, you know, sat in the chairs and watched TV. I just always treated it like I was a rookie because I knew that at some point I would be a rookie again, um, for a, for a paid department. So, oh, that's awesome. Kept, yeah. I kept that same mindset the whole time. <laughs> and I'm sure that helped. That helped a ton because you didn't get a whiplash when you got back into crookie mode. <laughs> right. Easy trans. Well, not easy, but N- not easy, but <laughs> less hard transition. There you go. That's so. <laughs> a great way of putting that less hard. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. So, so yeah, actually, let's go ahead and transition then into the Williams Key stuff. So, let's start with the very, very basic, broadest question. And you probably get asked all the time why what what got you thinking that like okay we need this or you need to you need to make something like this what happened (laughs) yeah there's an easy answer to that question um so i went from installing these two thousand dollar doors to watching these doors being destroyed every shift and just rip your heart out (laughs) and i know that there's better ways to get get the doors open than busting and busting them down and sometimes these doors were like they're on the wrong house or you know like it it was a mistake that we even took the door down you know now poor grandma is has no security anymore you know um so i had i'd made a bunch of tools for myself in the in the construction trade and this was just one that I modified to bypass strikes on locks to open up doors and doesn't work on every single door, but it's definitely worth the worth a shot, you know, versus it's fun to use your Halligans, right? But <laughs> um, if you don't need to, there's plenty of opportunity to break a door. And uh, if you're able to just open the door without doing any damage, the your our customers you know Mm -hmm. appreciate that um and uh so i made the the williams key for myself and i work in west hollywood and it's a pretty busy area and lots of apartments and high-rise and commercial buildings and so every day i was opening up these doors in a new way that wasn't doing damage Mm-hmm. And there, there's 39 guys at my station split up into three shifts. So a lot of eyes were seeing the work that I was doing. And before long, you know, they kept seeing me pull this tool out and they wanted it. Right. <laughs> hey, hey, do you mind making me one of those? And it was like it took a while for me to make one. Mm-hmm. So eventually enough people asked me to where I took it to a shop to have it replicated where they made a batch. And I think it was probably like, I don't know, 20 of them or or something. Um, And yeah, everybody wanted one. And I wasn't really trying to make money off it or charge, but people wanted to pay for them, you know, Mm -hmm. and and they they went quick. So (laughs) I was like, oh, shoot, maybe I should make a few more, you know, and and before long, word of mouth and everybody wanted one. And uh, yeah, I just spread like wildfire and there's a lot of uh i wouldn't call them haters because they like the guys that know me love and support me but they'll never you know let me know that (laughs) Um, (laughs) so there's a lot of like pushback i guess a little bit of 
of my tool um so like people would intentionally try anything else to open the door other than uh, like my my tool that yeah. was sitting right there you know that would like clearly <laughs> open it um which you know it happens fine. yeah that's fine you know you're you're not re- you're not really hurting my feelings cuz now at this point there's thousands and thousands of people that carry this tool and mm-hmm. i i don't have to prove anything to anybody like just people know it works um so yeah that it, it's funny seeing my department react to the tool versus um the rest of the US all 50 states and probably like 20 or 30 countries internationally too that all carry it um that must have just like blown your mind like every time you got a new state or even the new country and stuff you're just like (laughs) yeah i know i know our listeners can't see my office but there's a map behind me um and you probably can't see the pins but there's pins all over it Mm. of uh like any any new international especially order i'll mark it with a pin and then the i don't think you can see the u.s but the u.s is just it's just red yeah it's just completely covered (laughs) i gave up trying to track on the u.s because um some days i'll get 100 orders so it's like it's it's very busy it's it's taken over every day off that i have um (laughs) but it's awesome and it seems like it's helping people and obviously people like it and i've seen so many videos on this you know like and I have to say, I haven't seen it in person yet. I haven't tried it in person or anything, but I've I've seen so many videos and it looks so slick. Like, I don't, I don't understand like how it could be that easy. It's just like, wait, what? And it takes like a few seconds to a minute, depending on the person, you know, and how, how the door is working and everything. It's just like, that's way faster than a Halligan's ever going to do anything. Yeah. And I only try and show the easy ones, you know, cause nobody wants to watch a five minute video of, <laughs> of somebody not getting in, but, um, so the way we train and the people who carry it, they know the doors it works on. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they'll, they won't pull it out if they know like, oh, they're, I've tried that door before. It doesn't work because for this reason or it has a deadbolt or whatever. Um, but I guess, yeah, yeah if, if you're good with going into that, what kinds of doors does it work on versus doesn't work on typically? So it's, it's great um, in like industrial areas, big cities, apartments uh commercial stuff um it works on more outward swinging doors than inward but it it does work on both okay um if you're able to visualize the strike of a lock in a door Mm -hmm. um that's a pretty good indicator it's going to work on it um but the probably the best feature of the williams key is it'll slide behind anti-vandal plates so there's guards there's guards people will put on locks to keep uh like thieves out and and stuff but uh this tool will work around that guard um as long as it's like you know 12 inches or or so Mm -hmm. some some of them will span the whole width of the door and then the key won't work on that but yeah i sell a 35 inch version i Um, saw that That thing looks sweet that's the magnum (laughs) and uh there's a folding version coming out a folding uh, version of the magnum of the magnum oh, yeah. so you can't put it in your pocket or anything but it's a little bit more portable <laughs> and, and easier for me to ship technically um, you so. can put anything <laughs> in your pocket just how far does it stick out <laughs> exactly yeah it's, it's like putting a shotgun in your pocket so. yeah. <laughs> uh, okay so um, that gets into yeah. another good question then too okay so obviously the folding because especially with the, the traditional williams key because everyone wanted the folding version i remember that the whole thing happening right um, just to be- fit better, easy into mm-hmm. bunker gear and things like that. So I'm assuming it works the same, but how does it work the same with the little, um, the little guy in the middle with or the, the... With the screw on yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the folding version came about because everybody liked the standard and, but they weren't able to put it in their pocket. So yeah, it was like number one request, Hey, can you make a folding version? So the folding version is the standard version with a screw on it pretty much and uh the handle uh can come off if you want it to um most people keep it on but it it folds up so that it's more portable goes in your pocket and the way that it's engineered it's going to be harder on audio but i'll, I'll try and explain yeah, it. yeah, yeah. um first there's of all a, there's a... <laughs> if you guys uh, try to look up some videos of the folding one too okay so like you know go out there i'll try to link some different youtube videos or something out there <laughs> into yeah, the show notes <laughs> on our website there's tons of videos too yeah um 
but uh the way the handle works is there's a track there's a sliding track and a screw and it allows the handle and the screw to slide back out of the way so that the blade of the williams key can still fit in the reveal of the door jam and push mm. the strike aside um it's because it has a moving part um like the engineering of it it's it's less strong because yeah. of because of moving part um so the standard version the original is still the strongest key mm -hmm. it's just not as portable so um it and it also the standard version has one extra feature that it's like rarely used but um it's the diagonal reach where you can hold the tip of the blade and fit the entire thing oh. if you can see daylight through the door jam you okay. can fit the entire key through minus the tip that you're holding on to and get that diagonal reach span um where the, the key is 12 inches normally the blade is 12 inches so you're, mm -hmm. you're gonna get like a like maybe two more inches out of it and be able to hook a strike with the handle side which is a shove knife um okay so it, it's it's not used often but um We've definitely used it in that well, way. Especially if you know your district and you, you've you been able to train with it, you know, just, I mean, go to, when you're going on some of these medical calls or whatever you're going on, you know, just go test it out and see, do you need that extra two inches? Will it help? Will it work? I mean, yeah. that's, that's nice. Yeah, exactly. So the folding version cannot do that because okay. the screw in that scenario gets in the way. So full mm -hmm. disclosure, um, that yeah that it, it is what it is but people um like the folding version better and i, I mean i don't blame them it's like it's very yeah. convenient and it works on most stuff so yeah. yeah again it's another thing you don't have to remember to grab from the rig you can have it in your pocket and just yeah. have it ready to go so i know like uh my husband carries just a, a set of lock picks in his in his gear and everything and stuff and like he's been looking into like the folding key and everything and you know just something else just to put in his gear to make it easier you know so and especially where you can do this instead of lock picking it can be a lot faster <laughs> yeah and, <laughs> so. and I, I lock i lock pick as well um just with my carpentry background and stuff and mm -hmm. in, installing locks all day long i i acquired that skill and i've uh kept it up and it, it changes as new lo new locks come out and there's different types of lock picks but it that is a more much more advanced skill yeah. that not a lot of firemen have um maybe probably less than one percent of firemen are able to pick a lock it, it, it's a helpful skill but yeah if there's a fire we're not wasting time doing that or anything like emergent um mm -hmm. we'll, we'll probably break the door because that's more important than oh yeah <laughs> preserving the lock right of so. course no it's just awesome because it doesn't seem like this is necessarily like a one tool fix all i feel like there's there's no ever one tool fixes all for everything but it's another nice thing to have you know in your pocket to be able to actually like get stuff done you know yeah. so if you know the type of door this works on if you train on it before easily pull this out of your little kit you're good to go exactly so tool for the toolbox yeah exactly yeah. tool for the toolbox and i i carry a toolbox too that like i don't bring it in on all the calls but it's on the rig with me and if i know my district and where i'm going i know it takes mm -hmm. a certain type of tool maybe it's a panic hardware i'll grab a j hook which will go through the reveal and then grab the panic and open it if it's a double panic yeah um so yeah there's tons of tools out there and not not one tool works for everything but i was gonna say because yeah because you don't just have the the williams key on your site you have the the uh slip knife the uh the swipe tool stuff on yeah. there too so um firefighter swipe tool and i partnered together on a inward a williams key version the inward door slip knife it's a mouthful <laughs> Um, and that works really good on inward, inward swinging doors, which the Williams key works not as well on, um, just, it works on some, but not all where the inward, mm -hmm. inward door slip knife, um, <laughs> is, is really good. And, um, I would even recommend it for like parents. If you have kids and the kid locks themselves in the bathroom, um, it's good for stuff like that. Cause a lot of our interior doors swing inward. Um, mm -hmm. So once you're inside a building, uh, that's where that tool comes in handy. And uh, yeah, residential front doors swing inwards a lot of the time, too. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely and it's really tiny. It looks like a M&M candy tube. 
<laughs> that you can just keep in your pocket and it's a piece of rolled up plastic. Um, yeah, really quick and efficient. And it'll also tell you it won't it won't work on a deadbolt. Neither will the Williams key, mm -hmm. um, but it will tell you if, if it's engaged and because um, yeah. you can check and see and you're like, oh, shoot, deadbolt's engaged. All right. Plan B. We're going to break the door <laughs> or, yeah, or yeah. pick it or, or whatever. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Whatever need be. And yeah. I but mean, we have found that uh, most people don't use their dead their deadbolt, especially if they're in a hurry leaving their house or they just forget. It's like an extra security feature that most people don't tend to lock. Yeah. I feel like most people, like if they're home at night, they probably will. But if they're running out the door, yeah, they don't think about it. Yeah. So yeah, you're shutting it down for the night. Hopefully that's part of your routine. Maybe you drank too much. You forgot. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. We, we just find a lot of the times it's not locked. Yeah, that's interesting to see. And yeah, that definitely comes from first hand experience then of of seeing that. Um, I know there was one specific time where I'm bringing in my head. Um, my husband and I both got locked out of our house and no keys or nothing trying to figure out what to do. And so we're scrounging in his truck trying to find something to figure out to like get our door open. And we found something to kind of work or whatever, but it, it was very, very similar then to the swipe tools, what we ended up doing and whatever. And I could just imagine just like getting several of those little swipe tools and putting one in each car and putting one like somewhere else. Like, you know, just so like you get locked out of our house. Like, okay, we can at least get back in. <laughs> yeah. I have one in my turnout pants, my turnout jacket, my brush coat. We have yeah. a lot of different like outfits and stuff that we wear. <laughs> Even my uniform shirt, it's small enough to fit in the pocket oh, of fantastic. a uniform. Yeah. So I got them everywhere. Yeah. I mean, like how many, you know, EMS calls call, do you like need stuff like that on? And it happens all the time. You know, someone falls out of bed or whatever and their door is locked and okay, you got to get in quickly. So, yeah. So, okay. So with the, with all of the tools, all the things that you've been able to do with it, I kind of want to get into maybe not fun. I don't know. Fun. I, feel, I need to figure out a different word than fun. Interesting. I don't know. What are some interesting either uses or tips or tricks or things? This is a chance for your head to go into your playground of like interesting things that you either, either either come across with it or heard of, you know, being used with the Williams key. If you have anything. Like um, outside the box scenarios where the key was used or. This is, this is an open play box. I really don't know where we're going with this. Okay. <laughs> um. Okay, here's a story because people send me stories on social media and stuff. Um, so this this is a fireman, firefighter who uh, works for LA County and he transferred to a new station. So he's still getting the, the routine down and their gym is detached from the fire station. Okay. He, li he likes to work out late at night. So he went to work out and they have a rookie at that station who shut the station down for the night while this other fireman was still working out he got locked out of the station oh goodness luckily <laughs> he had a williams key in his truck and <laughs> he was able to uh get back into the station um without doing damage to the station and without <laughs> waking up everybody and having an embarrassing story i guess yeah <laughs> um so i mean that's a mild story um i i guess i was in a scenario where we had a what did it come in as uh it, it seemed like a non-urgent like a welfare check type of call mm -hmm. where we showed up and the door was locked and we were gonna wait for like it, it was an apartment we we're gonna wait for the management to go find the keys and open the door for us and it was like trying to get him on the phone like it, it was going to take a little <laughs> bit of time for the the door to get open with the keys mm -hmm. i opened it with the williams key and there was a person in full arrest oh, inside goodness. That, that was still viable so we're, we were able to like save the life by not waiting maybe an extra yeah. five or five or ten minutes for these keys to come um so that was cool you know like it, I, I feel like the Williams kids actually saved lives before. Yeah, um, that's that's awesome. I, I mean, sec seconds do count. It helps. And yeah, when you think it's just a routine call or something like that and it turns into something greater. <laughs> right. We, we didn't have a sense of urgen urgency with that call um, just because of how it came in. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, yeah, OK, let's make some phone calls. Let's figure out. Let's talk to the neighbors, you know, see when the last time anybody's opened this door or whatever. Yeah. 
I was like, no, let's just go in, open it yeah. up. Oh, oh shoot, we have a, a real call, a full full arrest. Yeah. Grab the stuff, and we worked. Yeah, we worked on the person, and they were transported. So, I believe that. Cool. Hopefully, they had a good outcome. You know, I, we never see that side of it, but yeah. Um. Oh, one more story I can think of was I think it was a a cop, um, who used the tool to get into somebody who was like on a you know on a ledge or like about to jump out of a window commit suicide and he was able to get in and like make the save and get the guy before he jumped so oh my gosh okay so i don't know why my brain didn't go to other first responder personnel it didn't go to cops it didn't you know it, it for some reason it just didn't go there oh but yeah that we, is yeah <laughs> so we sell to the fbi uh, a bunch of government a bunch of military uh department of justice homeland border patrol swat navy seals um i've got a big list of like <laughs> interesting people you know and, and yeah. organizations that have bought it um and now with the uh like the school shooting stuff like mm -hmm. it, it is on everybody's radar so a lot of police departments are like looking more into how they can make entry quickly quietly um without like shooting or busting down a door and yes uh alerting whoever's in there that they're there you know they they want to be discreet sometimes mm -hmm. um and williams is great for that well and so. honestly it's it's very cost effective for police departments or other entities to be able to afford this to do that very very quickly easily quietly like you're saying yeah and it's like the the williams key is cheap enough to where if you lose it or break it or it gets stolen which happens too uh <laughs> it, it's cheap right so you can just yeah. go buy a new one and it's not like you lost a battering ram or like yeah some you know halligans can be a couple hundred bucks even so yeah. i mean my uh, husband's looking at this tool i can't remember which tool he wants but something's like 300 bucks i'm like oof okay i was like you better not lose this thing you <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we do custom engraving so uh it's less likely to get stolen you know it's got your name on it and, and stuff like that that's a that's a big selling point for the Williams key. So, yeah, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> actually, well, yeah, the, keep it straight too. Those are engravers behind me, the blue things. <laughs> so you do so, it all in house for that part, anyways. That part, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, we uh, yeah we package and ship out of here. There's a factory that powder coats and screen prints and then, uh, laser jet cuts all the material. Then I get it ready to ship. But if a uh, custom order comes in, like a name, or um, we'll put logos and stuff on them too, then I'll do oh, that. That's cool. That is yeah. cool. I might, I'm going to have to hit you up. Okay. <laughs> get a couple for couplings, you know? Yeah. No, I'll, I'll send you one. No problem. Oh, man. That'd be, that'd be awesome. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Well, so th there's a lot more tools in the works. I'm always coming up with, with stuff. I love hearing um, about new stuff. I've got 3D printers. I've I started developing uh, the Williams wedge, which glows in the dark. Those it looks look like a skull. Awesome. Yeah, they, so, they just look. Oh yeah. So well, yeah, I'm, I'm it, a huge it, fan it looks, of glow in the dark too. So there's that. But <laughs> oh, cool. Nice. So yeah, you're less li likely to lose it because yeah. it, it glows, and we lose wedges all the time. It's like one of those things people just forget. Um, yeah. So if there's something glowing on the ground, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, my wedge and uh, less likely to lose it. But the wedge looks like my logo. So it's a skull. Um, So it's very unique to my branding. Mm -hmm. And it's been super popular. Uh, <laughs> I'm having trouble like keeping up with the orders. I started um, I've had three different 3D printers that I started making them with. And now I've transitioned into urethane molding. Oh, um, is, is it better quality or how is that? Or is it just yeah, faster or it, it it's everything. So <laughs> it's it's more pliable. So it's it's less brittle. It's less likely to break. Mm. I'm able to um, make it glow. Have you heard of Identifier? They're a, they're a company not. that makes a lot of glow in the dark stuff. Our department has um, the numbers on our helmets. They glow. Mm -hmm. And um, that's made by a company called Identifier. So I I found this out by accident, but in my opinion, they're the best company when it comes to glow in the dark stuff. And I am writing this down. <laughs> I, I ended up sourcing my glow powder from the same company that they source their glow powder from. Ah, okay. And, 
as I was getting it, I saw like their logo on a bunch of boxes and stuff in this warehouse. And I'm like, oh, shoot, you guys supply to them too? And they're like, oh, yeah. And I think they're out of like Florida or I don't know, this is somewhere like far away from where I am. So <laughs> I was like, oh, that was small world. Like I wouldn't have thought that they were getting yeah. their stuff from the same place. But ever since I started using that glow in the dark stuff, uh, the wedges have been like really, really glowy. Really going? Oh, man. And, um, and with the mold version, they, they bend a little bit. So oh, I, okay. I like that. Yeah. So it actually makes it better for wedging doors and less likely to break. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that if you like really slam the door on it hard or whatever, it'll leave a little indent, but it heals itself. Like it, that wasn't even by design. It just, I was like, <laughs> oh, that's, that's a cool feature. You know? Yeah, that's so awesome. It, I can tout this now. <laughs> yeah. It goes back to its normal shape. Um, and then, yeah, it'll be easier for me to like mass produce and mm -hmm. cheaper and put, yeah, potentially faster. I just have to get a good, yeah, a good, good system with it and system down. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I just a, the fact that it looks progress. like your logo is, is like the coolest thing. Like, well, honestly, who doesn't want a, a skull wedge? I mean, <laughs> yeah, everybody loves skulls, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, I, I totally have like there. I have a skull key that I use as my uh, quote unquote skeleton key to my house and stuff. Right. You know, oh, nice. for, for my house key. But like, you know, you just skulls everywhere. We're firefighters. We like skulls. It's, it's a thing. <laughs> yeah. So I'll show you this and I'll I'll describe it to your listeners. But I 3D printed this and it's a skull hand. Oh, yeah. And, and it, it holds my wedding ring on it. And it says <laughs> till death do us part. So I'm big, I'm big into skulls and I, I love being creative and that is doing, cool. doing all sorts of fun stuff on the side too. Oh, I, I love that ring holder. That is very, that is, that is very creative and very unique. <laughs> Thank you. I just it's wish awesome. the ring still fit on my fingers. <laughs> Hands are too fat now, but <laughs> it happens. It happens. I was like, I started using, um, the, is it Qualo or Kalo? I don't know exactly how you pronounce them. Um, but I started using those at one point and I have it upstairs for when I'm doing fire stuff or whatever, but like Are those the stretchy ones. Yeah. Yeah. The stretchy, okay. yeah. The stretchy ones and stuff like that. And I like those ones so far, but I've heard, I mean, there's tons of them out there now, you know, for different companies and stuff, but yeah, it kind of gets tough too. Like when your rings don't start, don't fit anymore. It's just like, Oh no, <laughs> yeah. I had to get mine resized at one point too. So mine, mine's made out of Jack Daniels whiskey barrel with a gold inlay. Oh and yeah. You're not getting that resized. Yeah. So I'm like, <laughs> I think I need to buy a new one. I really like it. It's super light, but um, that is cool. I need a new one. I liked wearing it, but it just doesn't I didn't even anymore. know they made that. I'm a big Jack Daniels fan. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is all right. I, I do not blame you one bit. I am as well. <laughs> <laughs> nice okay so since we got talking about the wedges and stuff i want to touch on them too um and i should have actually looked it up but and you're going to be able to tell me in two seconds what it is but the the uh the rope that you have for the uh buddy Bre was a buddy brother no the uh oh, yeah. the uh, rip the rip cord yeah the rip cord okay yeah i didn't know if you had seen that or not um so yes i make another glow in the dark product uh, i think it's very unique and it um was born from a issue i came across um that's usually how i i hate it how that usually is what makes these come about but yes <laughs> so our department uses a scba that doesn't need the rip cord currently but we're transitioning to a new ba that we've tested out and i don't want to say the name just because i don't want to give yeah. them a bad name or anything um but we did find a problem where it's really hard to get the buddy breather out mm. and for those of you listening buddy breather is a 39 inch cord at least on ours that attaches to another 39 inch cord on the scba and it allows you to breathe the air of another firefighter if something goes wrong with your self-contained breathing apparatus so these buddy breathers are stored in a little compartment on the side of the BA and sometimes they're really tough getting out. So I, I did a bunch of tests with these SCBAs and some people at my department under no stress with the lights on, with only wearing the breathing apparatus. Um, I asked them to get their buddy breather out and it was taking guys if they could do it over a minute. Oh, and that's not good. Yeah. This is not with gloves on or anything. Oh. So it, it was like a big issue. Um, yeah. And I was like, we don't train on this very much, but 
the guys I was having do it knew where it was. Like half the people don't even know like what side your buddy breather's on mm-hmm. and stuff. It's on your left side. Um, <laughs> left for life. So, yeah. So <laughs> I, yeah, these, these are needed when the seconds count. So I, I made this product. Um, you're able to feel it with a gloved hand. It's a pyramid shape. It's the only thing on you that feels like that. And it hangs out of your buddy breather. And then your buddy can see it too because it glows in the dark. You probably won't be able to see it, but you'll be able to feel it. And you can, it's a it's called the RIP cord. So RIP stands ah. for rescue in progress. Um, <laughs> and also like it kind of goes with the the skull the, theme and the... the the dark branding that I've <laughs> created. Um, but uh, yeah, so you you rip it and um, it brings out the buddy breather and. So yeah, that that's something else I came up with and that I sell. So I, I love how you thought of to make it a shape that you don't have anything else of like that on you. That is so unique, and I'm I'm the the fact that you actually went to that point of thinking through this product to like okay, this is gonna be feel so different. You're gonna have to know what this was when you touch it. Yeah, and yeah. I, initially it was a ball shape, and I was like, eh, it's hard to find. So. Mm-hmm. And then the weight of it too. I wanted it a certain weight so it you could actually feel it. Yeah. And then uh yeah, switched to a pyramid and I was like, okay, yeah, that's perfect. It's got a bunch of corners. There's nothing else in that area that's gonna feel like that. So you'll know when you grab it. Yeah. So if anyone out there is having any issues with their buddy breathers, no matter I guess I'd say even no matter what brand it is, if you're having if you issues with it, you yeah. know, grab check out one of these and see if it works. <laughs> yeah. They're they're available on WilliamsKey.com. So. <laughs> subtle, not so subtle plug. Uh, <laughs> but all right, is there anything else you'd like to touch on with the Williams Key, with with any of the products, any of the anything? Um, just that it's been a, a pleasure and a joy, like uh, interacting with all the different types of people in all different fields of service, all over the world all over the u.s um i'm i'm very personable I, I love to talk shop um i get messages every day from people uh i love the content that gets sent in the the pictures the videos and the stories um it's kind of what makes it all worth it for me i work really hard i have not a lot of free time between a full career firefighter job and and this um so but but I do it because I love doing it and mm-hmm. I, and I'm going to continue to do it as long as it's a positive outcome for everybody. And um, yeah, I guess I just want to say thanks to your listeners and everybody <laughs> out there that just supported me and supported you, too. Awesome. All right. If you're good with it, we'll go on to the last section of the show. Yeah. Okay, so for everyone who's here listening, whether you're new or you've been a continued listener for a while, we're jumping into the family firefighter survival section of the show. This section was born out of me needing to learn how to deal with a career firefighter that I'm married to and and kind of dig into this world. But then, you know, you start realizing that even with volunteer side, you need this as well. So this is a really good section for everybody. And basically, overall, big synopsis, I need to like actually make a make an actual like reading I do of this. This is the thing I need pre-recorded here, Ah. (laughs) but I never have it. And I always stumble over it. But basically all in all, this is just a time for us to talk about our lives with our families, how we make things work. Uh, What's the good? What's the bad? What's the ugly? You know, as, as we're going to go as um, surface level or as deep as, as whoever wants to, you know, every guest is different on what they want to do, but we're going to get into pretty much anything. This is a wide open, again, toy box, sandbox, getting into whatever we feel like talking about. And I have no scripted questions for this section, except for the very first question. So Trevor, what does your family look like? (laughs) It's, it's uh, changing quickly. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes, it is. Well, because you said four months is, is when your daughter's coming, your your second daughter. Yeah. So, (laughs) well, she's, she's maybe closer to six months um she's due in june june 13th uh that'll be my second child uh two girls uh the one girl i have right now is nine months old her name is kylie uh she's absolute joy she's smiley kylie she's always happy um (laughs) 
she tricked us into having another one and uh <laughs> and pretty soon too so they'll be 14 months apart um so well, hopefully be they're, they'll be good good friends and stuff <laughs> but i know we're gonna have our hands full we actually got a puppy a week ago um oh, for what, for what breed for, is the puppy for kylie uh kind corso or king corso i don't know it's, if i actually know that <laughs> um it's kind of a rare dog it's a italian mastiff okay and they grow to be like 150 160 pounds um yes i love big dogs <laughs> yeah huge big dog um <laughs> kind of intimidating looking almost like a pit bull uh okay I guess, yeah. but, but really big and uh but really good with family and very smart and trainable and they don't shed like it's a really cool dog so um <laughs> we, yeah it's a puppy right now and we're actually redoing the backyard to accommodate for for the dog and for the kids yeah um so we're putting in some turf and a nice wall and and whatnot um so yeah that's part of the growing family but we it's been tough it, it yeah it's been really tough for us uh especially i didn't know a dog would be so much so much work um, <laughs> a dog is can be worse than a kid at times i, yeah, I mean yeah. like I've, I've had a couple dogs myself i've never had a kid yet but uh, you just imagine like they get into a lot and yeah <laughs> since getting a dog i've heard that some people who have dogs and kids have stated and made the claim that uh sometimes a puppy is harder than a baby <laughs> <laughs> um which i didn't hear before i got the the dog but now i'm hearing this so woohoo where where were you all all you people like come on <laughs> <laughs> yeah now you're chiming in um so yeah we're we're still finding our footing um as far as being new parents and we've been married uh, four years um and we've we've been dating for a long time but um we've so me and my wife uh we met in high school. We were both homeschooled and we took a class together. Oh, cool. And then we didn't get together then. Um, many years went by before all the stars aligned and we ended up uh, dating in our 20s. Um, that actually kind of reminds me of me and my husband. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Met in high school and then like didn't date till afterwards or anything. And yeah. Yeah. Some Sometimes yeah, that's yeah. how it's supposed to be, I guess. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we, we, uh, before kids, which was not that too long ago, um, we liked to just do everything like you know, travel and hang out with friends, very sociable. Um, so this has been a big, uh, lifestyle change for us. I think mm -hmm. we're handling it pretty good. My wife's a trooper. Um, she's just like, she's been a great fire wife. Uh, she understands the fire culture and she's the one that like other firewives go to and like get advice from and oh, stuff. That's nice. and she, she just is like, she gets it, you know, and she's always been super supportive. She was there like through every step of the, I went through four academies. Um, <laughs> so the last one with LA County, she was there helping shining my boots, testing me on all the questions, making my lunches, just like oh, man. 110% supportive. Um, so she knows how hard I worked and she worked, you know, just as hard to, you know, support me through all that process and, um, and now on the job. So mm -hmm. we do this thing, or I guess she's kind of implemented it where she asked me about my shift, you know, every time I get home and she'll just listen and she does that every single time that and is that, so important yeah so she'll just let me talk and if i need to you know get some stuff off my chest she's she's just a great listener and yeah i don't always need her to tell me anything about what i'm telling her <laughs> but uh she'll listen to it all you know she yeah. she doesn't she wants it unfiltered and never you know is judgmental about anything and it's just been everything I need. And it's like a breath, a breath of fresh air every time I get home, <laughs> um, having somebody like that around. No, it's just, oh, it is just so refreshing to hear because like so many of us, husband, wife, both, like everybody, we just need to be heard and just let a chance to just say everything that happened, blurt it all out. I don't know, you know, ramble on. If you're stuck at home with the kids all day, you know, just like listen to her you know, go through that whole thing, you know, don't necessarily have to give any advice or anything, just 
be there and make her feel heard. You know, she's there with you after shift making you feel heard. And like, that's one of the biggest complaints that I hear from other friends or other people is just, they feel like they're not, their spouse doesn't understand or won't listen to them or whatever. It's like, it, it, you don't have to even understand everything that they're going through. You just have to listen and just be someone to bounce, bounce their feelings off of that. That's what you're there for. You're there for support of each other, you know, to help each other get through these hard things. And you can't have all the answers to their jobs, but yeah, you can help. And I just, I love hearing that. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, sometimes listening is like all you need, and it's it's big. Yeah, and it is big. Not, not not enough people do it. I don't yeah. think so. Uh, I think it's important. Um, yeah, we don't have all the answers, and we're we're still trying to find our our rhythm. Some some days it feels like we're drowning and just trying to keep our head above <laughs> water, and I'm sure lots of people feel that way. But um, nobody's perfect, no matter how much they it appears that they are. You know. Yeah. And I, I know you're saying that you had, you know, with being on the job and doing the Williams key, that takes up a lot of time and things like that. Uh, how I know it's, I know it's extremely difficult because I deal with it too, with my stuff and my husband and everything, but how, how do you start to deal with then carving time out or dealing with making sure that everything's good at home and you're trying to keep everybody in a good place? How do you go about that? Yeah. Sometimes it uh doesn't happen as as much yeah. as I'd like, but I will try and um rearrange my schedule as much as possible to get a couple of days in a row at home. Mm -hmm. Um our schedule is kind of weird. I mean, it's 10 days a month, 24 hour shifts, but it's like hard for me to explain the days because they're just like all jumbled all over the place. It's okay. not like a, it's not like a 4896 or any any common schedule yeah, i know that, like my husband's is anybody would weird. recognize yeah his is uh 24 on 24 off and you do that for two weeks and then you have a full week off oh see and, i've never heard of that one and see that and that one's that one's weird to everybody else but like and the two weeks are really weird but the week off is like the best yeah <laughs> but yeah it's it's not simple like a 4896 or 2470 or 2448 or yeah whatever <laughs> Yeah. So what I'll do, cause we we're allowed to trade days and stuff and okay. um, work with other shifts to accommodate each other. So I'll try and get a couple of days off in a row, a couple of times a month, like three or four days is awesome. If I can, mm -hmm. um, it, during our busy season, sometimes I'm working 20 days, you know, at the station, Yeah. but, um, getting home as much as possible. I took as much time off as I could when our our daughter was born and that was great except the money part of it but yeah. the time part yep. of it was great it's a, it's a trade-off you know <laughs> it's, it's a time or money you, yeah time or money and that's yeah yeah it's tough <laughs> um but we do try and uh we try and see our friends a lot we have a lot of we have a lot of friends and um my I feel like my wife always is, has like a month of stuff scheduled like ahead of us <laughs> and I'm just like oh <laughs> So she helps us carve out the time, even if there isn't any. Good. Um, and I, I have to multitask a lot. Um, yeah. Sometimes I'll I'll be putting stickers on stuff like in the car, you know, like she'll drive and I'll like work on Williamski stuff while we're mm -hmm. going someplace. Um, but we're making it work, and we try and we try and travel. Um, still, even with our our newborn, she's been on six airplanes already. <laughs> Taking um, it like a champ, huh? Yeah, six airplanes before she was six months. And we just got her passport. We're going to Costa Rica this month at the end oh, of the month. Fantastic. So that'll be the first international trip. And maybe I'll bring some Williams keys with me. And, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, we, uh, we force our time off, I guess you could say. Like yeah. We, we have to, we have to make that time. I, I, I think that's a good strategy to take especially with with how your shifts work and everything and yeah where you get into the busy season you can't always guarantee you're going to be home you know it's it's tough especially over there in california with things you know um but i mean that's 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 something anyone from anywhere can take like if you are too busy if you don't have time if you have too many things to do the multitasking and the forcing yourself to do things with your family whatever it is, you know, whether it be like every month on this day, on this type of week or whatever, you do this thing or whatever, or like, Hey, 
month or two out, we're planning this one thing together, you know, to do, you know, you, you're I, and talking about the multitasking just in the car. That is such a good idea. And I think a lot of us don't take advantage of the opportunities like that, you know, or to work on something while you're cooking supper or something like that, you know, too, you could do things like that. If well, as, as long as it's safe, <laughs> but I should say, you know, don't start any fires in your kitchen, but <laughs> yeah, we, we order, we order out a lot, but um, that saves us time. <laughs> yeah. And if we watch a movie or something, I'm usually doing something like putting a sticker in an envelope or, you know, something like that. In the meantime, I'm usually like doing something that um, benefits the business while we're relax relaxing you know (laughs) so i was wondering then with uh your new daughter coming and things is there anything you anticipate changing with that with your system of how how things are working now or do you hope that it kind of settles in pretty easily or (laughs) you just don't know what it's like we have no idea what we're about (laughs) to get ourselves into um part of me thinks that a little bit of the learning curve will we'll be gone because we just mm-hmm. learned how to be parents for a baby. And now we're going to kind of start over and I know it'll be probably a different personality, Yeah, but we have the rhythm of how to do that with like a, a baby. Like it's, yeah, it's not straightforward, but there's like a method to it. Um, but juggling a, I guess she'll be like one, a little bit over one years old and walking like she's not walking yet but she'll be walking and she'll probably have teeth by then and maybe starting to talk and like it seems like every day she's a little bit bigger and a little bit more developed and now we oh like today she let the dog out of his cage like oh, on, her own, on her own like she's we, nine months old yeah we didn't she can't even walk but she she crawled over to it and there's two latches and she opened them up and the, now the dog's out and causing trouble and peeing on the floor and stuff so yeah i I guess we have absolutely no idea what we're getting ourselves into but i feel like that's like a perfect sitcom episode right there yeah it was just (laughs) out of nowhere because i was in my office doing some work and i just hear chaos like (laughs) erupt out of nowhere downstairs and i'm like oh no what is going on so yeah we're gonna take it one diaper at a time and and go from there (laughs) Oh, that is, that is cool. That is cool. So just out of, out of curiosity or anything, does, does your daughter come, uh, Kylie, right? Does mm-hmm. she, does she come and visit you at the station or anything or, you know, your new wife or anything or how does she so, like that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, not usually, but mm-hmm. I, so LA County has one boat station and I'm one of the few guys that's trained to work on the boat. Oh, that's cool. Um, as, <laughs> as a deck hand. So I how did said, we not get into that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. So it's out of Marina Del Rey and it's a beautiful station. There's like, you know, it's, it's on the water. You, you get to, they leave all the windows and doors open and you can smell the ocean and oh. see the sunrise in the morning. And they have, they actually have two boats, but uh, one's a reserve. So one, yeah, yeah. one in service at a time. And I tend to work there quite a bit because of my training Mm -hmm. for the boat. So uh, my wife and Kylie visited me and got to go out on the boat and get a little tour of the marina while we were doing some training. And they'd never done that before. I thought my wife had, but she hadn't. And, um, And especially Kylie, my little girl had never been on that boat before so it, it was really <laughs> cool and she got to um there was like a ton, there's a dock with like tons of sea lions on it uh-huh. so we took her to see them and yeah it was it was great so <laughs> I, I i was like this is really cool for me that you guys are getting to experience this um just because it's such a unique position mm-hmm. and then it's cool for them obviously because it's just on a boat in the ocean and <laughs> out of nowhere like randomly you know yeah, it's like I don't think any of us firefighters take it for granted, but at the same time, we kind of forget how awesome the stuff we get to do is sometimes. And the fact when you when you get to share that with friends and family, when they get to see just even just a small portion of at least the good times, you know, at the station, you know, it just right. it's so cool. <laughs> yeah, she's like, "You're on vacation. That that's not fair. You're you're at work." 
I'm like, no, I'm working too. Trust me. There's, like, there's trust lots me. of other stuff going on here too, but <laughs> you only see the nice parts. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. That's awesome. Okay. All right. I think we've had a pretty, pretty all over and full podcast. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> is there anything else on the family firefighter survival section you want to hit Trevor that we haven't talked about yet? I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of that one thing. That one that, thing. That... What were we talking about when it came to your head? Maybe uh, that'll jog it. <laughs> I think it had to do with time management, mm. but I haven't figured that part out yet. So <laughs> it, it probably wasn't good advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think any advice is good advice. <laughs> yeah. So my, my general advice is uh, always keep your doors open. Anytime you have an opportunity to do something, try it, try new things, meet new people. Mm. Um, you never know what, who you're going to meet, who's watching. And uh, so, yeah, just keep opportunities open because there's a lot of cool things you'll end up running into out there that if you never give yourself a chance, you wouldn't be there. A hundred percent. One hundred percent. It's like if I didn't take the one step for my husband's like, oh, you should come take pictures of the fire department on the on their training night. I'm like, OK, I would have done this stuff at all. <laughs> I would have been a photographer for the rest of my life. And that's about it, which would just would have been nice, but this is fun. <laughs> yeah. See, there's a million little things like that. Like, Oh, I never would have met this person or I never would have been a fireman if this didn't happen or whatever, yeah. you know? So yeah, it's crazy. Do, do lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So Trevor, how can people find you find the Williams key if they want to reach out to you? Uh, yeah. So I'm probably most active on Instagram. The Williams key is the handle on Instagram. Same with TikTok. TikTok actually has more followers. It's a newer <laughs> account, but it grew really fast. There's like videos with 3 million views on there and stuff. Oh, cool. um, so th that stuff's taken off. Uh, the Williams key at gmail.com if you want to email me. And I'm just sure my number is floating around out there. <laughs> I'm not going to share it, but if if you dig deep enough, you can text me or something too. <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, like I yeah. said, I'm open to answering any types of questions. You can send me pictures of doors if you're having trouble or you have a question. If you want to talk shop, I'm I'm available. So, or even about getting hired or like have a question about the fire service. Um, I love helping out. So. That's awesome. That's that's what I love to hear from people. You're just like, just I want to talk. Let's talk. I don't care. You know, I'm a down to earth person, too. And that's some things that people have a hard time realizing is like we're all just firefighters who yeah. love talking shop <laughs> all day, every day, it seems like. Absolutely. And don't forget to go to williamskey.com and actually get one of these. But <laughs> that's right. <laughs> awesome. All right. I think that'll that'll be it for the day. I think that's going to be it for the podcast. You cool. guys have a good night, day, whatever time you're listening to this, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Bye. <laughs> See ya. Thanks for coming by and listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to leave a rating and a review wherever you're listening. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Couplings Fire Podcast. See you next time, everybody.